Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to A Gathering Place, brought to you by the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce and hosted by Marilyn Hemingway. And I am so excited today about today's topic, as I usually am, because I love just hanging out with our viewing audience on A Gathering Place, just really meeting the change makers impacting the Gullah community, um, African Americans, Black folks out there who are doing the work uh, regarding the community, our history, education, small businesses, you know, anything you could think about, I try to bring them on and talk to folks. And today's topic is our African-American intellectual traditions. And I have the person that wrote the book who we really want to talk to. So get your questions ready, folks. Get those questions ready and we will answer them right after this. Hello, I'm Marilyn Hemingway and welcome to A Gathering Place. I said, I'm stepping back because we have young voices who want to be heard and they're moving on something. Branding is really important to you and your business. Even a basic type of technology, you learn it all. Good question. So folks, we're back and let's just jump on into it and learn more about the African-American intellectual tradition in America and one of the experts, one of the academic experts, and we'll learn a little bit more about him. But let's welcome our guest today, Dr. Derek Allridge. Oh, I hit the wrong button, folks. <laughs> that happens sometimes. Hey, Dr. Allridge, how are you doing? Hey, how are you doing this afternoon, Meryl? I am doing great. You know, I'm going to call you Derek because I usually yeah. do because I know I'm going to slip up if I try to be formal. Yes. So I think no might as well go say Derek. Y'all, no yes. Y'all, Derek have known, and I have known each other for years. So yeah. I'm just so happy to have a chance to catch up with him and find out what's going on and just really dive into what you've been up to lately and talk about our topic. Let's just go. You know, I like to just start pretty basic, Derek. Um, I want you to start with... Um, you know, what is the African-American intellect? How would you describe it? Yes, uh, that's a good question. It's a question I've been asked many times. What What is the African-American intellectual tradition or what is the Black intellectual tradition? So let me back into this and, and tell you and give you a response. Um, when I was a graduate student at Penn State, a few things happened to me. Um, and one was I would go to these dissertation um, uh, uh, defenses and I would often hear students uh, talking about or doing research, talking about their research on the Black experience. But then when they got to the theoretical part of talking about their research on the Black experience, it might have something to do with the education of Black people. They would say something like, oh, and I'm using a Deweyan framework to help us understand or tease out what this really means. Or well, I'm using a Freirean framework, Apollo, and I, and I love Paulo Freire's work, and I love Dewey's work. And, you know, I began to ask myself, why won't we use the framework of Black thinkers, of Black intellectuals, if we're studying Black people, right? And so around that same time, I was taking my first course in uh, Africana studies with uh, a scholar named Jim, James Stewart. And, you know, I, I discussed this, this kind of phenomenon or this problem with them. And his answer to me was, well, the reason they don't is because there hasn't been enough scholarship extrapolating the ideas of African-American thinkers and African-American intellectuals. So why don't you do that? Why don't you do some of that work to try to illuminate and make people aware that there are Black scholars and intellectuals that we can draw on to help us understand the Black experience, right? And so that led eventually to a dissertation I wrote on W.E.B. Du Bois and a subsequent uh, book that I wrote on Du Bois. But so so since I graduated or since being a student in Penn State, it started in 1993, I've been studying Black thought and particularly Black thought in education, but Black thought in general as well. So I was at a conference, uh, the Association for the Study of uh, African-American Life and History, which was founded by uh, Carter G. Woodson, the historian Carter G. Woodson, and a friend of mine, uh, Cornelius Bonham and I, he's a historian at Purdue, 
we were discussing this phenomenon again, and this was about six years ago. And uh, we said, you know what? Let's write a book on the Black intellectual tradition. Let's, let's produce a volume that engages Black thought uh, in the United States in the 20th century, right? And to be fair uh, about this, there have been other books that have come out on the Black intellectual tradition. One of my favorites uh, was a book that came out about two or three years before ours by the historian Keisha Blaine, uh, uh, Chris Cameron, I'm thinking of Ashley Farmer. And so they're a group of um, young historians who produce a magnificent book. Um, and so ours came out this year. And this is what it looked like. It's called The Black Intellectual Tr Tradition, African-American Thought in the 20th Century. And basically the argument is, is that black people have intellectual thought, that we've thought about issues. Now, uh, you when I said that your eyebrows went up, but let me tell you what, let me, let me tell you something. Go ahead. There Go are ahead. some scholars, one by the name of the late Stanley Crouch, who said that black people don't have a black intellectual tradition, that all of their thinking and thought is Come, has come from the Western intellectual tradition. So in our book, we challenge Stanley Crouch's notion that there is not a black intellectual tradition. And we show him that there is, not him, but we show the world that there is a black intellectual tradition. Of course, we start in the early part of the 20th century with thinkers like Anna Julia Cooper, uh, Du Bois, uh, Nanny Helen Burroughs. And we walk ourselves on through the 20th century and we touch on some of these scholars. And you find the black intellectual traditional black thought in black literature, you find it in black art, you find it in black music, um, and you find it, I mean, you find you can find it anywhere in lyrics. I mean, you find it in hip hop music. In fact. So um, our argument is that there is a tradition and it spans the 20th century and it continues to this day. Yeah, you did see my eyebrows raised, I guess, because I'm spoiled because, you know, I was raised in, in an academic family and, you know, I hear those names. Not all of them do I recognize them, but I certainly recognize Carter G. Woodson, um, Du Bois, you know, a couple of others you mentioned. And just to think that someone thought that there was not, you know, that our intellect came out of Western intellect and not to understand Western intellect to me, and it's just Maryland speaker, came out of African intellect. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, you know, so, 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 it, so, so it kind of threw me, I mean, yeah. and I'm not even, even, let's not even get that deep to it. It's just that I know the traditions of the HBCUs. There's always been to me some type of intellect, and maybe I'm off about this. So a couple of questions I have for you too. But go ahead, you were going to say well, something. I was just going to say, to be fair, the Black intellectual tradition and the African American intellectual tra tradition certainly draws from the Western intellectual tradition uh, because we are uh, a part, particularly in the United States, Black folks are part of the Western intellectual tradition. But our argument is that something unique occurred as well, that uh, a system of thought that expressly addresses the black condition uh, developed in the early part of the 20th century and you know, progressed throughout the 20th century, that's its own thing, that's separate than the Western intellectual tradition. And that's the argument that we make. Let me ask you this then. I, I get what you just said, how that developed, but where, where did it develop from? I mean, when I throw, I think of black intellect, I think of not only academia, but I also think, and, I, and that's one of the reasons I named the show A Gathering Place. I think of the barbershops, the beauty salons, the, the gathering under the trees where people are really sitting there discussing the community, the condition of the community, et cetera, et cetera. Is that considered part of that intellect or is that something totally different yes yes most definitely i mean you know i don't go to the barbershop anymore as you can see but i'm gonna cut my own hair i cut my own head let me say that but anyway um you know some of the best places that you can access black thought black ideas well will be in uh you know hair salons will be in barbershops will be in uh, non-academic spaces, and um, you know, you know, extending the idea that Antonio Gramsci, the Italian 
theorist and intellectual stated, he, he argued that these places are fertile ground for the development of what he called the organic intellectuals. And these are intellectuals that sometimes don't have the kind of uh, academic letters and, and what have you. But so we argue that that's very much a part of the intellectual uh, uh, a tradition. So that's an excellent point that 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 you make. So how do you take the academia part of it, the letters, if you will, as you described, and how does it impact the non-academics? Or how can you make it more engaging with non-academics? Uh, if that makes sense, what I'm asking here. Yeah, yeah. So there certainly needs to be a closer relationship with so-called academic intellectuals and organic intellectuals, or mean, or 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 intellectuals that are in the in the community. And we see some of this, uh, particularly in the field of music. So if you if you look, there have been quite a few books that uh, written by academics that engage. Um, uh, rap music, uh, hip hop culture, etc. I'm currently working on a book called The Hip Hop Mind that will hopefully be out in early 2023 um, that engages this very question that you're asking. It's like, how can we take what we're learning in academia, what we know in academia, particularly as it pertains to the black intellectual tradition and apply it to our understanding of, you know, culture, i.e. hip hop culture. And how can hip hop culture inform black intellectuals? So I'm not by any means saying that I came up with this idea because we see this. I can, you know, rattle off the name of several scholars who have worked in this area. But I think there needs to be more of this kind of work. We need to see more work uh, from academics, uh, you know, telling us what's going on in barbershops. We're seeing some what's going on in hair salons, because that's where you can get a very good sense of you know, what everyday black people are thinking, how they are seeing the world. That's very, very important. So um, these are some, uh, you know, good questions. And I have one more too. One of the projects that I'm working on now is called Teachers in the Movement. Um, I grew up uh, in a small town. I know my viewers probably won't know this town. It's called Rock Hill, South Carolina. Um, just joking. I hope that if you're from South Carolina, you know. uh, and I was so impressed with my teachers growing up in Rock Hill. So before we had Michael Eric Dyson, before we had Cornel West, before we had all of the public intellectuals who I like and I know, uh, we had our public intellectuals were black teachers, mm -hmm. right? They were black teachers. There were people in my neighborhood like Mr. Newton, like Mrs. Smalls, like my mother, uh, Stevie Williams. And a host of Mr. Bowell, and I could just go on and on, who we looked up to as being scholarly and intellectuals. And if you think about the way that the Black community has viewed, historically viewed teachers, they've always been our scholars. They've always been our intellectuals, right? So um, one of the things that we're trying to do with the project that I'm working at on a, at UVA that I mentioned called Teachers in the Movement is we're trying to bring the voices of those teachers to our classrooms today, particularly to teachers who are thinking about teachers. So if you wanna know about the black intellectual tradition in the field of education, you need to talk to teachers who were teaching during the civil rights movement in particular, right? Which one of the most transformative uh, 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 movements in the 20th century. And so that's what we're doing with that. We're trying to extrapolate their ideas and say, hey, look, if you want to learn how to teach in the era of Black Lives Matters, if you want to know how to engage students uh, in this contemporary social movement, let's put you in conversation with teachers who taught in the last transformative social movement. So our argument is that ideas can, can occur anywhere and that teachers play a very important role. So you're, you're speaking when you just said that in putting you in touch with those teachers in the civil rights movement in the tradition of a September Clark. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and you know, Esau Jenkins down in Johns Island, South Carolina. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, certainly, certainly. So, so, uh, you know, many people don't know that September Clark was certainly one of the 
intellectuals of the civil rights movement. We call her the mother of the civil rights movement. That That's cool. She was that as well as Dr. King called her, but she was also one of the preeminent intellectuals of the movement. And in, in my opinion, of the latter of the uh, second half of the 20th century. Folks don't know she studied with W.E.B. Du Bois wow. at uh, Atlanta University, and uh, and has written about that. And she wrote and she wrote about it. And so, um, and you know, Du Bois is considered one of our major intellectuals. Mm-hmm. So uh, that relationship is is very um, is it, 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 we we see it in in, in her papers. Um, and some of the teachers that I've taught, at least one of them in Rock Hill, just in conversation, I said, what informs your thinking? She said, you know, if there's one thing, I had a teacher in the eighth grade and her name was Miss Clark. I said, who? And so we start, she said, September Clark was her, I think seventh or eighth grade teacher. So um, we see how this information or this black intellectual tradition is passed down from generation to generation. It is and not, it's going back to your neighborhood. I could definitely relate to that because my neighborhood was full of educators, um, from the teachers to to the to the principals. Or my mother was a librarian, and there are two things when you mentioned the neighborhood that I kind of on a granular level remembered calling the teachers. We would call them professor. You didn't call them Mister and Miss. You called them Professor Miller. You know, you because that was a sign of respect, a sign of that education, and also it's also a sign that their opportunities were probably limited. So when they came back home with a certain educational level, how fortunate were we that those are the folks going back to the young lady you were talking to, these are folks that we lived with, you know, that they professor, you know. Howard, Professor Miller, I could just rattle it off that these are the people that you were just, you went to church with, you lived with, and, and that 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 force of intellect that we just didn't even think about, it was just there. Yeah, you, you, you make an excellent point, and I was just smiling when you were saying that because I've been working on this project, uh, you know, exploring the idea of Black teachers as intellectuals since about 2014, and no matter where I go, I hear the same thing. He said, well, we called our black teachers professor. In fact, there is a book written by the historian Vanessa Soto Walker. The name of the book is Hello Professor, right? And it's about a public school teacher and principal. And, you know, she just brings that to light. And you said just now how fortunate we were to have those teachers, those intellectuals, those administrators with us. We were because had it been a different time, had it been today, some of those individuals would have gone on to the private sector. Mm-hmm. Some of them would have been in academia, but we had them during that period, uh, you know, from the 1960s, you know, 1960s and earlier on up through the 70s, 80s. We had them in our classrooms, in their communities, working one-on-one with students. And that's just, that was powerful. It was powerful. And you know something I've been talking about recently, and it's indirectly Uh, related to this with the census in my hometown, Georgetown, for the last 150 years, we've been losing the 18 to 64 year old demographic because they leave to one, to get away from violence, lynchings, etc. Also for education and economic opportunity. But we forget that there was a core group that went and got educated and they came back home in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and they started retiring in the 70s and 80s. What we're seeing now, not only in my small hometown of Georgetown, but other areas, is that group is starting to die. In the last 20 years, they've been starting to die. And we see that in the census results. Like in my hometown, there's been in the last 10 years, an 8% drop in the black community and population. And wow. people think it's the 18 and 64. Well, we've been losing them for the last 150 years. And wow. they usually just dribble back when they retire. What we've been losing in the last 20 years is that core group of intellects who you could always count on to vote. You could count on them to have uh 
social groups, they were, they're the ones with the fraternities and sororities, but even beyond that, they're the ones who established like bridge clubs. Yeah. Um, there's a group called um King's Daughter Society in Georgetown. Just those little private groups that people don't know about, but they created this society that was very dynamic. And we, once again, you saw it. I grew up in that. You took it for granted. But as you get older, you appreciate it. And now I'm starting to realize we're in the last 20 years, we're starting to lose those. And we're losing that, that intellect. I, I don't know where a disconnect came. That's why I asked you going back to that question. How do we make that connection between the academia, the intellect, and just, you know, John in the barbershop, Johnetta in the beauty salon? Yeah. Well, one thing we've got to do, and it's something that we have, we, we used to do a better job with this in the black community, is we can't allow there to be a disconnect between academia and the community. You know, W.E.B. Du Bois talked about this uh, constantly, that we need to look at universities, black universities or universities in general, we need to look at them like the Yorubu school. In other words, uh, if we look at the Yorubu school uh, in Africa, we see that there is a very close relationship between uh, institutions of higher learning and communities. In fact, there's a transference of knowledge between the university and community. They're, they're, they're almost like hand in glove. They're very connected. And Du Bois put it, uh, he, he really believed in this. And while he was at Atlanta University, he started something with another scar scholar named Ira de A. Reed. They started something that was called the People's College. And this is before the internet. This is before uh, 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 online courses. Du Bois was actually going into the community, giving uh, lectures in public schools and community centers. He was inviting students on campus at Atlanta University, and he was giving lectures and courses on the radio in the 1940s. So wow. there needs to be some the revitalization of the idea of people's colleges, right, that make these types of connections. So that would be one one, one kind of um, strategy um, to do it. And again, the other one is how do we transfer this knowledge? What I really want to do now is bring these teachers from the 50s and 60s into schools of education, into universities to talk to students, not just black students, all students, about their experiences, what they did, you know, how they taught, what their pedagogy was like. Because my argument is that much of the black intellectual tradition can be found in the pedagogy of these teachers. A recent book just came out by a uh, scholar. Uh, his name is Jarvis Givens. It's called Fugitive Pedagogy. Came out on Harvard University Press in which he has studied some of the, uh, studied black teachers use of Carter G. Woodson's uh, educational materials, particularly his history books and things like that. And so you can see the black intellectual tradition coming through with their use of Carter G. Whitson's materials. And my interviews for Teachers in the Movement, which is found at teachersinthemovement.com. You all can go see about 60 of the interviews we've done there. Uh, the teachers talk about who influenced their pedagogy. Some of them will say, oh, I read Carter G. Woodson's uh, a book, The Story of the Negro Retold, or I read Du Bois's the souls of black folk and that movement. And so that would influence how they talk or they were influenced by a teacher that they had or a college professor that taught them at South Carolina State College, right? And so what we see is the tradition being passed on from generation to generation through these teachers, these educators. You know, I'm glad you, said that and mentioned that because in my terms it's every time and I, and I know my friends and and my fellow community out here in south carolina uh, understand when i say this i said every time someone passes we lose a library there you go and there, a lot of folks around me they're starting to understand that now especially during this pandemic we have lost so many libraries um 
not just the professors, the teachers, but your grandparents. Um, and since you mentioned it, I encourage people, let me just a little, a little PSA right now, record your parents, record your grandparents, any, you can get them and just ask them questions about your family, about their lives. They have such stories to, to tell and share. And this is something that you can hold on to for generations. Because I think understanding our intellect gives us context of what happens today. You know, I, there's a thread that runs through everything that we do. Nothing happens in a vacuum, but I think because we no longer appreciate um, the intellect, if you will, our history, if you will, there's been a, a, a disconnect from that thread. And I think if we just talk about it more, um, understand it more, reach out and talk to folks, bring them in, it's going to give us context about what's happening right now and today. Um, a good example is the Ahmaud Arbery uh, trial and the results of that and what the defense tried to do. And you have to understand why they tried to do that and the response to what they tried to do with bringing in the racial overtones and stuff and everything. So so thank you for saying that. Um, I, I got your, I got your, I'm going to put that up to the information that you just shared with us. But I did want to share a word here because um, if you hear it, sometimes we forget. <laughs> so if you heard him say pedagogy, this is the art and science of teaching the function or work of a teacher, y'all. So yeah, this is stuff that we're talking about today, that African-American intellect. Um, so I wrote some notes, Hidden Figures. Have you read that book? I have to say that I am ashamed to say I have, of course I saw the movie and I did not read, I have not read the book, but the uh, author of the book is a UVA graduate and I did not even have a chance. I was teaching when she came here to give, she's given a few talks here. So I have not read it, but I've seen the film. I know it's not the same thing. What you just, what, the interesting thing, it's different the way that book came about. They actually, while she was writing the book, they licensed the movie. So the movie came out before the book. Oh. So you didn't have that yin yang of, you know, people saying, oh, the, the book is better. The book actually came out after the movie, but it filled in so much with Katherine Johnson and the other scientists not only of them has scientists at work, it gave you their lives and their lives within the community. And what we're talking about, the African-American intellect, it, it talked about their fraternities and sororities, the church life, their community life and how their intellect, well, you know, it didn't talk about, it's like, here's their intellect at church, but their interactions in these different areas of their lives and how much was informed by their intellect by yes. their and how they operated and how they raised their children also exactly. um so um, you know i wrote notes as you were talking so i'm trying to go through the notes <laughs> so we did hidden figures books music oh i knew what my question was and thank you you talked about this just a little bit Regarding your hip hop culture in that book, has the hip hop artists are creating, are they aware that it's, it's intellectual also? Um, there are some, especially those who are connected to academia in some way, they understand in a very substantive way um, that they are contributing to an African American or black intellectual tradition, you know, someone like Chuck D certainly understands that. He had parents who were involved in the civil rights movement. Uh, I should probably mention at one point or another, maybe Kanye West understood that. Maybe he still does. I'm not gonna make a judgment on it because his mother was a, uh, a literature professor of black literature. Uh, now I certainly understands that his father was, a, father was a jazz musician and he often references historical uh, black leaders as well as intellectuals in his work. So there are many people who acknowledge this. Uh, certainly Tupac, uh, uh, 
uh, understood that. Um, and I've had the opportunity to interview people uh, who knew Tupac, who knew him closely, and he, he understood that. But one of the things that I've also been faced with with that book, one of the challenges is that what if people, do people who don't understand that they're contributing to that or they're, but they are espousing ideas that I don't necessarily like, like, are those ideas also part of the black intellectual tradition? Yeah, you know, I'm grappling, uh, I'm grappling with that. Perhaps it is. I mean, we can't decide which ideas are part of the black intellectual tradition and which ideas are 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 not. So uh Tupac, for inst in instance, introduced me to a writer called Donald Goins. He's singing in one of his songs, How Do You Want It? I think his name is song. He references Donald Goins. I said, who is this Donald Goins? Well, I learned that Donald Goins, I think I have some Donald Goins books behind me in my other bookshelf. He was an African-American um, scholar. He wasn't, I don't think, was like a trained academic or anything, but he wrote about uh, the hood. He wrote about, and he, and he wrote many books, and that book resonate. his books resonated to what Marx would call the lumpen proletariat or, you know, I don't like to use that term underclass, but people, regular everyday people, right? And so those ideas also have to be looked at as part of the black and intellectual tradition. We don't like, I remember thinking that NWA, when they came out in the late 80s, mid late to late 80s, I said, man, this stuff sounds horrible. But now I have a very different viewpoint about what they were talking about. And they certainly would be considered some of the music that they, you know, some of some of the ideas that they put forth or that they illuminated would certainly be considered part of that tradition, just as Donald Goins uh, writings are now considered part of the black and intellectual tradition. So I have to constantly be careful of making adjustments as a as a scholar and a historian of black thought uh, when I'm trying to to make sense of all this. I know you're focusing on hip hop, but do you look at jazz also? Have you looked at jazz? And, I, and as you were speaking, you know who I was thinking about? Theolonious Monk. Yeah. And a lot of his music, mathematical, very mathematical. And he actually wrote, you know, the formulas and stuff, his math on his music. So y'all don't realize that. Please go look that up. It's actually not hard to find. Yeah. But have you looked at jazz also? Um, you know, just... Not not specifically, but you know, if you're writing about uh, rap music and hip hop, you're gonna just come across jazz naturally because uh, you know if you look at the genealogy of hip hop, uh, jazz is certainly there. Uh, you know, I really need to sit down and read Robin D. G. Kelly's uh, I think five or six hundred page book on Thelonious um, Monk, but I certainly see jazz. You know, someone like John Coltrane and other mm -hmm. jazz artists definitely are. Uh, part of the black intellectual tradition and, and people have written about um, John Coltrane's uh, you know work as part of this law the, as part of the black intellectual tradition you know John Coltrane a uh, new civil rights activist he he met uh, Malcolm X uh, he had long wanted to meet Malcolm X and he finally had an opportunity to, to talk with him and I just can only imagine what that what that conversation was about so yeah a lot of these jazz artists intersected. They were in the same space. Um, and I'm thinking about in the 1960s that um, these great thinkers and activists were. You know, I apologize. I'm like so into listening to you. We have some comments. <laughs> let me go. Let me go look at these comments, y'all. Thank you. Hey, Robert. All right. How are you doing? Oh, don't forget Nina Simone. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah. Very yeah. much so. Very oh, much so. I'm yeah, yeah. <laughs> De and definitely, then, Robert. I'm thinking about uh, Mississippi Goddamn, right? Uh, yeah. Very yeah. important song. And uh, there's this um, MC from uh, from North Carolina. I know she lived in Raleigh at one time uh, called Rhapsody. And Rhapsody uh, gives much credit to N Nina Simone in terms of influencing her. So, uh, you know, Nina Simone, certainly, definitely. So thank you. Yeah, and Marvin and Stevie, yep, definitely. Oh yeah, yep. all of them. Yep, yep. And the, me, songs in the key and of Huff. life. Songs in the key of life is, I mean, that's a that's a text. It's no different than uh, in its importance than the voices of the souls of black folks or uh, 
Anna Julia Cooper is a voice from the South. And so that's the way I look at these um, the, these artists and look at their LPs. I looked at I look at them as texts and I study them as texts. And that's part that's their intellectual text, their intellectual treatise. You know, I think and going it's a show that I did. Gala Spirituals is a book. Um, Dr. Eric Crawford, he's at Benedict College now. He was at the um, Charles Joyner Gala Institute at Coastal Carolina University. What's the name of the book? Gala Spirituals is uh -huh. the um, title, and there's a subtitle that I can't remember off the top of my head. But I did interview him. Okay. So awesome. one of my shows, he said, but we really we listened to some of the non-copyrighted music that's out on YouTube now as we were doing the show. And as we were listening to the music, you can hear bluegrass, you can hear blues, you can hear jazz. So we, he, cause the book is about the, the origins, you know, the gut right. spiritual origins. So this genealogy that we talk about goes all the way back folks. I mean, it's not just hip hop. It's that thread I talked about earlier. That thread is found in our musical genealogy also, it's also found in our academic genealogy. It evolves. Everything informs the next step and it evolves. Um, and we have, which to me, the Gullah language, and I tell people, it is not dying. You hear that? Gullah is not dying. Gullah is evolving. Right. And I did a show on the awesome. Gullah Geechee origins of African-American history, um, Dr. Sammy Livingston, out of, doc, I see Dr. Samuel Livingston, another friend of mine, who's at Morehouse College. And he's done that research and is continuing to do that research. And we got into the music of it also. And then here comes uh, Dr. Eric Crawford along who actually wrote about Gullah Sparrow. Yeah, he just recently released. Um, there's also not only those academics with doctors, the PhDs, there are academics such as uh, Damon Fordham, who teaches at the Citadel, who's written five or six books, and he writes um, the, the the history books, um, one he's doing now that's getting ready to be released, five black, uh, five African-American senators who went up against Benjamin Pitchfork Tillman. Wow. So that book's getting ready to come out. He'll be on the show also. But I mention all of this because you have the barbershop under the tree, the beauty salon intellects, then you have those intellects who are writing about your local history. You know, those are those regional state history that you don't think about. We don't think about a Senator Robert Anderson and how powerful his life was. We don't think about a Joseph Hayne Rainey, the first black U.S. congressman, and how intellectual he was right. and how powerful he was. And then we have the academics, the, the, the boys, the, the Derek Allridge, the professors, you know, the Ph.D.s who are writing those books. And all of this is African-American intellect. But we don't think of a, at least I don't think, you know, the average person <laughs> who's just going about their lives. We don't think about the broad picture of that African American intellect. But yeah. it's good to see that that somebody's thinking about it. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, African American thought is very complex, and that's why we need to do so much more work on it. One of the things that you think about the contemporary dilemma uh, conversations that's going on now around issues of critical race theory regarding issues of the political right and the political left, being a liberal or conservative. You know, my students and I talk about this and they'll engage me about what does this mean in the black community? I said, no, that's not, that's conversation. You know, the larger society has created those constructs. But I said, those constructs don't necessarily map onto black thought the way they do in the media, in popular culture, et cetera, because that's it, African-American people uh, by your definition of conservative, can be very conservative as a whole, but they can be, by your definition of liberal, liberal too. And I said, so when I hear these constructs, I said, I just smile when I hear a person, uh, you know, on television say, oh, the liberal uh, uh, Jesse Jackson, or they call it, I was like, yeah, but that's not, we don't really, we don't really talk like that within the community. That's conversation with outside because our thought is very complex and complicated, and uh, in a, in a good way, not 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 in a bad way, in a in a good way. I take it that way with how you meant it. So thank you for saying that. And one other piece I want to add to this also, because I've been fortunate that the 
the work I've done, the traveling I've done, is to spend a lot of time in local Black museums. And I'm talking about those museums that were started by um, the, the teacher who retired and recognized we have to say some of this stuff and give it context because you could go and uh, in Vicksburg, Mississippi, their local black museum, and I hope it's still open. It's been a few years since I've been down there. Um, I spent an afternoon in their local black museum that was started. It was at that time staffed by a young black male, but the original founder was a black female. She had passed by the time I got down there that turned her house into a museum. And when she passed, she left the house as a museum. And it was just filled with all of this research, you know, for Vicksburg, Mississippi's Black history. And we spent the afternoon just in there. He was just talking to me, giving me that Vicksburg Black history. Um, one thing that stood out to me, like the courthouse in Vicksburg, if you look at it from the sky, you know, the bird's eye view, it's um the the mosque. It looks like a mosque. And that was done deliberately because the original architect and engineer was a white man who got drunk on the job and he either died or had such an accident he couldn't finish the job. Where his assistant was an enslaved African who was not formally educated, but he was an engineer. He finished the job. So when you're looking at the Vicksburg, Mississippi mm -hmm. courthouse from bird's eye view, it looks like a mosque. And no one knew this for years because obviously who's flying, right? At right. the time when this is built in the 1800s. Wow, but once awesome. they start flying over it, they realize, and there are pictures and stuff now, but you know, the intellect, the, the thought that I'm building this, knowing that people were not realizing what I'm building and taking the thought to say, I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity and leave my imprint for future generations. And let me tell you, the Vicksburg, Mississippi courthouse sits on a hill. It is the highest point in the, in the city of Vicksburg, Mississippi. And it's like one of those old buildings that they, they, they revere, you know, it's like, that's our courthouse. They love it. You know, it's the pictures of the courthouse. And, and most people have no idea that it's, it's, it's shaped like a mosque um, until you see the pictures. I that, learned that in the local black museum. And if I hadn't taken that time to just spend that afternoon with that young man, I would have never known it. That's that, Afri you said the complexity of the African-American intellect is just fascinating. Yeah, and I'm so happy you mentioned uh, museums and that's an awesome story. Uh, museums are sure have always been sites of, um, you know, intellectual evolution of intellectual thought within black communities. And museums don't always have to be uh, the types of museums that we think about when we think about museums. We need to reconceptualize what we think about museums. I mean, in, in, in some of my work with uh, these black teachers, I've gone into communities and I've gone to these community centers, right? And these community centers will have quilts that people from generations have, uh, you know, have, have, have done and put them in there and there will be books. People will donate their, and these places are museums, right, as well. So I think um, in the African American community, we certainly need to think of a, uh, as a museum as not just these kind of stuffy, um, sterile kind of um, institutions that you go to and you look at and you leave, right? That's right. That's right. We need to really think of them as organic living entities right. that that not only preserve history, but preserve the future, you know, that they're organic and, they're, and they themselves are evolving. And I wish more people would make an investment in those also. Fasc I'm, I'm constantly fascinated by these local museums and everything. So, so Derek, what else do we need to know about African-American intellect? I know you got some a deadline tonight. <laughs> Okay. Well, <laughs> I appreciate you hanging no, out with me and everything. No, 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 no word. Fascinating. You know, just, just, just um, for people to uh, preserve, preserve uh, materials or items that they think uh, or hold on to them that they think kind of provides us some insight into black thought. 
when I interview teachers, I will often ask them, do you happen to have your curriculum guide or in your lesson plan book? And they said, are you serious from 1965? Well, guess what? Some people would say, you know what? I might have it, right? And so those are a very important artifacts. So uh, that's one of the things that I always encourage people to do. I know, you know, folks will tell you not to hold on to that stuff, but that's very important for scholars, for people like me who are trying to really preserve, preserve that. The other thing, the best preservation, though, uh, for black intellectual thought will be what you suggested at the top of the show. And that would be to interview your relatives, people in your family. Um, I've been doing oral history for 20 years now, and I did not interview my father. And he told me so many stories about my family that I'm preserving here, but I wish I would have interviewed. So I didn't make that same mistake with my mother. I've interviewed her. And so uh, I would encourage you, just take out, just take out your uh, phone and just turn it on and let them, your, your relatives or friends talk because uh, that might be the only recording you have of them, of their thought, right? And so I would encourage you. Uh, I get emails um, or letters, handwritten letters most of the time, at least once or twice a year from people who will say to me, thank you so much for interviewing my mother, my grandma, because that's the only video that we have of them. And that's the only audio that we have of them talking. And we never would have thought to do that. So preserving artifacts is what I think uh, and, and oral and doing oral histories, I think, are, are very important to, uh, you know, making sure that we keep the black intellectual tradition moving forward. Thank you. Very good. I have a quick question um, about social media in particular. I, I recently I've gotten addicted to TikTok. <laughs> Have you asked, have you spent any time on TikTok? I have not, but I get it kind of secondhand because people post it on Instagram, so I get to watch it there. Okay, because okay. I was just there's there's those uh, I guess you could say the organic intellectuals who are on there. Of course, we it's social media, so we have to use discernment, and of course they have the algorithms and everything that are sending you information. But it, it most certainly if you use the sermon, it will make you think and consider new things um, that are out there. And the wonderful thing about social media, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, the one of the positive is it has democratized uh, information. The flip side of that is probably too much information and people can't handle it. But the positive side, it has really democratize information and and they're a great source so any thoughts regarding that at all yeah there <laughs> this is a very interesting question mainly because yeah definitely it has democratized it so when i'm doing my work on hip-hop right uh i go to mc's facebook twitter i go to their accounts and see what they're posting and sometimes they will and i say i can't get an interview with them but sometimes they will post a response to the question that I would have for them, right? And when they do that, I go ahead and take a picture of it or a screenshot of it because I can use it. If they put it out there, they meant for it to be consumed, to be to be used. So definitely does that. That's a, a plus. And um, we got to start thinking of social media as an archive too. Days of an uh, archive uh, being at a location uh, a long way away and you have to go in there you have to get permission to ask them to bring out the boxes and the folders that's certainly going to continue to exist but a lot of things are right now on youtube i discovered and you know i wanted to do these interviews and i said i need to see if i can find interviews of some of these mc i'm on see if i can interview them and i said let me just google it on youtube i said it can't be that simple boom many of them come right up there then wow. i thought about npr terry gross She's interviewed a lot of the MCs that I want. So I don't necessarily have to have this one-on-one -on -one, uh, interview with folks uh, because they've done a number of them. So uh, social media uh, is an archive. Now, there's one challenge that I'm concerned about, and that is this. A lot of my research, I look at correspondence. 
letters that have been written from one scholar to another, right? A letter that Du Bois might have written to say uh, Nanny Helen Burroughs. Well, in the age of email, that's something that I don't, that we've lost. How do we get that? So a historian looking for a correspondence between two individuals uh, in 19 or in 20, 2021, how would they get that correspondence? Do they not have it anymore? That So there's some bad parts to it too. There's some parts that are gonna be challenges and that correspondence is very important. So uh, definitely see the positives, but there's some parts that I'm somewhat concerned about. Yeah, and that kind of lends itself into the question of privacy, also emails more so than social media because social media if you put it out i know when i post stuff i know it's out there right. you know um but email the expectation may not necessarily mean it's out there even though nothing ever really disappears on the internet but you got to work hard to get to it. it's not as easy accessible and then you have a privacy question also you know i never really thought about that so i'm glad you mentioned it because i got to think about that too <laughs> you gave me something to think about Derek, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. this. was well, fascinating. This is why I love this show. I bring folks on and we have these conversations that I hope folks don't necessarily think about, but take advantage of and, and just take a moment to think beyond our regular everyday and, and see that's really out there, especially in the African American community, the Gullah community, what's happening out there and people who are impacting us and the ties of the Gullah community to other arenas out there and who would have thought you know if i hadn't had these conversations with the gala spirituals the thread the genealogy of music um introduced and created by black folks you know it's all tied together folks and this is why one of the reasons i have this show so Derek, i'm gonna see you in a minute but i'm gonna wrap up the show but thank you for coming on really thank you, um y'all been running at the bottom of the screen the entire show you can purchase his book at the Illinois Press, University of Illinois Press. Is that correct? Yep. Saying it that way? And go look up Dr. Derek P. Allridge. And um, and he shared with us teachersinthemovement.com. Please use that as a resource, especially the teachers out there who are viewing and listening to this show. And when I say teachers, not only the teachers in our schools, but the teachers at home, because ultimately it all starts at home, folks. Education really starts at home. Derek, I'll see you in a moment. Let me go ahead and close sure. out the show. Thank you for coming. Certainly appreciate you. Thank you for having me. All right. Y'all, wonderful show. I really appreciate Dr. Derek P. Alridge coming on with the University of Georgia, Virginia. He used to be at Georgia, so he's going to kick me on that. You know, and I didn't say his, his, um, uh, his bio, but he is the Philip J. Gibson Professor of Education and Affiliate Professor in the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies at the University of Georgia. He's a former school teacher and, as he said, a native of Rock Hill, South Carolina. He's an author of several books of, regarding Black history and education. Coming this Sunday, you know what it is, folks. Third Sunday Politics Talk, and I think this time we're going to be live. We're going to be live for real folks, not just on Facebook. Jamar, Brandon, and myself, we're going to meet up because Jamar is home for the holidays. I think we're going to make arrangements to meet up and be live. So stay tuned for some ads, some notices, because I think we're going to want y'all to come join us. So we're going to find a place. So if y'all in Charleston, you know a place where we can have good internet and go live with a gathering place and talk politics, y'all drop me a line and let me know. I'd appreciate it. Just drop it on our Facebook page and we'll come and hang out with you and talk politics this Sunday at four o'clock. We're looking forward to it. Thank you everybody for joining us today. A great show about African-American African -American intellectual traditions. Always enjoy my guests, especially Dr. Derek P. Allridge today. Looking forward to seeing all of you on Sunday. Stay tuned, peace out, enjoy, and have a good rest of your week. <laughs>